Okay, so tonight, um, if you're here with us for the first time, we're into week four, and we're picking up on the role of the prophet. And so, Faith, can you just jump up on the whiteboard? No, not on the whiteboard, just by the whiteboard. <laughs> and so, when we think about a prophet or the prophet in the church, what immediately comes to mind? What do you think of? Holy robes. <laughs> <laughs> Revelation. This might have to be censored, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Long hair. So, so you're thinking, what are you thinking? Long hair. Long hair? Okay. Locust. Locust. Weird people doing weird things. Okay. So clothing, maybe? Yeah? One who receives revelations. Revelation. Receiving revelation. Supernatural. Supernatural. A little bit out, crazy out there, yeah, yeah. And speaking for yourself, yeah. Old English. Old English, okay. Now, some of these can be right, some of them can be wrong. They're part of a, like a, a linear thing from, you know, right at the beginning to where we are now. But it's all nothing's wrong, nothing's right. So, yeah. Someone else? Uh, the future. Okay, the future. We're not going too fast for your faith, are we? Mind of God. Speaking the mind of God, which is part of that revelation. Yeah. 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 Fear of God, okay. Okay. The Old Testament often stoning. Stoning? Stoning the prophets. So, okay, we're going to pick up on some of this later on, Old Testament versus New Testament. But that was one of the um, stereotyped image of an Old Testament prophet, okay? So judgment, stoning, yeah. Hearing from God, sensitive voice. Oh, yeah, brilliant. You can get a gold star later on. Yeah. Prophecy. <laughs> Prophecy from a prophet, okay. <laughs> okay, just one more. Uh, prophet's reward. Prophet's reward. So explain a little bit more. Um, so I think she's in, I can't remember where, but it, like if you accept the prophet, mm. then you receive the prophet's reward. Cool. Okay. That's good. So when we think of a prophet, lots of things start to immediately just pop into our mind. Uh, it, it's like an avalanche of stuff that will come your way. And so tonight we're going to try and walk through or run through a lot of material um, so you get a, a little bit of an oversight of what the role of the prophet really is. Okay, so everyone's got their manuals. Mm -hmm. No one forsaken, forlorn. That's okay. And so the role of the prophet uh, is actually quite distinct. Um, we are an apostolic prophetic church. We, we will never apologize for that. That's just the way we are. That's the way God has mandated us as a local church. And so we're going to just look at some of the aspects of what that is tonight. And so prophets are a gift to the church. Now, it's a little bit distinct from the Holy Spirit gifting. You know, the Holy Spirit gives the gifts of wisdom, uh, knowledge, leadership, um, Holy Spirit tongues, interpretation of tongues and all that. But when we start to look at the, the office or the um, ascension gift of a prophet, that's actually a gift from Christ to the church. It's a little bit different. Uh, it's a little bit unique. Uh, but it doesn't mean to say it doesn't um, start with a gift because normally it does start with a gift and it does grow. But really the prophets are a gift from Christ to the church, uh, not appointed uh, by man, but appointed by Christ to the church. Uh, what they do is they help provide order in the church situation. Uh, they tend to speak to the foundations quite clearly. And some of it's in a public environment. Often it's done in a private uh, setting. It might be like, for example, it might be an eldership meeting. It might be on a national executive meeting, something like that. Um, Pastor James talked last week about a thing called a prophetic presbytery. Uh, we don't have them so much in our church, uh, but the New Life Movement, for example, does that. So normally once a year, they would invite in one or two ordained prophets and they would um, either speak to uh, the leadership or to the whole congregation or a blend of, of everything that's there. And um, anything can happen. 
but normally it's a revelation on a higher level. And so what they are is they're a gift to the church. And Ephesians 4.11 is a foundational verse uh, relating to the, the office of a prophet. <coughs> Not just the, uh, the prophet, but obviously apostles, pastors, teachers, and evangelists as well. And so uh, just reading this very quickly. Now these gifts from uh, Christ gave to the church are, are the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Is everyone fairly familiar with that scripture or is that a bit of a blind side for people? All familiar with it? Okay, and so what their role is, it's very specific. So they're speaking to the foundation, not just the, the prophet by themselves, but there's five ascension ministry gifts working together. And they're speaking into the foundations for a particular purpose, uh, building up and equipping God's people. Uh, they're teaching, they're training, they're preparing people. Um, ascension, what does that mean? Well, generally in the first century, uh, the first apostles, pastors, teachers, <coughs> visually saw Jesus in the flesh. They'd seen him, John, Peter, those guys had seen them. And so they thought, oh, well, they are the Ascension office ministries. Um, and then another term we use today is fivefold. And the fivefold comes out of Ephesians because there's five of these particular ministries that are presenting themselves. So they're interchangeable. Um, some of the churches started to bag this whole idea of Ascension ministry because it was a little bit time warped or they couldn't understand it. So they dispensed the whole idea of it. But you can't take Ephesians uh, out of the book of the Bible. You certainly can't take Ephesians 4.11 out of the Bible. So it's there for a reason. And God is restoring these ministries to the church. Okay. And so what the goal of these ministries are, it's quite clear. There's obviously five, five giftings or ministries. Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers and evangelists. Why? They're to prepare God's people. And so we're in a room tonight. What are we doing? We're preparing God's people. Why? Not just to have head knowledge, but for works of service. So you can take out your spiritual learning and use it. We want to be able to have applied learning so it's actually going to change the world. Um, building up the body of Christ. Um, well, we're talking about unity and, and maturity. Hopefully it's going somewhere because Paul, when he was ministering, had this problem with embryonic churches where he had to feed them milk. They never had the meat. And so what we want to do is bring, obviously, unity into the church and build maturity into the body of Christ at the same time. Why? For the fullness of Christ. Um, the church is not perfect, sadly. And so these ministries are here until the church basically is perfected. Okay, And that's going to take a bit of work. Uh, but the apostles, pastors, teachers, evangelists, that's generally the role that we've been assigned to do. Okay, So what is a definition of a prophet. Uh, lots of things could come out in the wash. We've seen some of the uh, things on the whiteboard about what we think a prophet is. Um, if we jump down to the Hebrew, because the Hebrew was probably more of an understanding from um, the Old Testament, it was to bubble up, to pour forth, to drop, to distill like heaven's <coughs> drop rain, uh, or, or, or hands obviously drip with perfume. There was a sense of dispensing on people, where the New Testament or the Greek style comes through as a public expounder or a forth teller of truth. Um, basic meaning not foretelling, but um, proclaiming rather than predicting. So there's a sense of understanding of what God is doing and what he's about to do. And so they proclaim something, they declare it, they don't predict what's going to happen. There's a sense of they know, there's a conviction that comes. And so that really is a very basic Defin de definition boiled down of what the role of the prophet is. Uh, any questions on that so far? Because um, if I keep on rattling on, you won't have a chance to actually interrupt and ask question questions if you need them. Okay, so prophets are oracles of God. Oracles are basically a voice piece of God. Um, what they do, as we've mentioned before, they bring God's word, they bring God's revelation. So Pastor Viv was talking about revelation today as an individual hearing it, it, it does something within the individual. It brings conviction about the call on their life. It's part of uh, the mandate that they have. Um, always open to, to new things in the spirit. Uh, things don't really change in the Bible, but there's always a new thing happening in the spirit. Um, they're capturing God's vision for the church and for individuals. There's destiny. Um, and so these things all go together. Like I was in Bible college once and... Um, the principal was uh, making a fast exit at 
out of the Bible college. He told no one. He had a, he had a letter of resignation in his pocket. And he was using the block course that we're on to basically uh, say sayonara to the, uh, to the Bible college. And I said to him, I won't mention the guy's name or the Bible college, but I could see three nights in a row in a dream where he'd come to Auckland, he'd come across the North Shore, across the Harbour Bridge, and he was in Belmont and Takapuna looking at real estate. Not just real estate, I could actually tell you the streets and the numbers of the houses and the colour of the house. And so I said to this guy, we'll call him nothing at this time for the sake of the, for the, sake of the name, but the thing is, um, I said to this guy, look, I'll call him Freddie for the sake of a name. Uh, <laughs> and so I said, Freddie, look, I've just been, got this conviction that you've been coming to Auckland on the sly, um, not just Auckland, but coming across Harbour Bridge, going to Takapuna and Belmont, and you've been looking at property, and you can see this guy's eyes, everything. He, 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 you know, he was just taken right aback, and I said, you've been looking at a house, and you've been thinking about buying a house in Jutland Road, and the number's 87 Jutland Road. It's the White House. And it's like, you know, he got really, really freaked. But there was an understanding, a revelation from heaven that he couldn't escape, that the God's call was on his life. The way he was exiting probably wasn't the right way of doing it, but the sense of God knew in his sovereignty what's happening and what he was trying to do in secret wasn't going to be kept that way. Um, now, I didn't get up and say that in the middle of the lecture um, that he was talking about, uh, was it, I think he was doing a book course on preaching, you know. Um, but revelation, God's vision, God's direction, all starting to fuse and mould together. Um, and as you pray about it, it can actually come back as a layered revelation. Like I had this dream, I think, three or four nights in a row, and I could start to see finer details as the, uh, the different nights went on. And um, then what was I supposed to do, it, do with it? That's the other question. Mm -hmm. And so I knew it was this guy, Freddie, um, but I just kept it to myself and at an appropriate time I started to share it with him. Um, yeah, he actually ended up becoming um, a superintendent of one of the other denominations. Um, but anyway, so, and also what they do is they bring God's will into a situation. Um, these are just common um, reference points is that, that, you'll, that you'll see in these ministries uh, as they represent themselves. So we often think of the uh, prophets of the Old Testament, Jeremiah, Hosea, Isaiah, um, Moses, Daniel. We, we know there's lots of guys in the Old Testament, but as we start to look in the New Testament, there's a whole bunch of them there as well. And I've just mentioned four of them um, briefly tonight, Judas and Silas. These were young guys that were hanging out with uh, Paul and uh, uh, the apostle uh, Apollos. Um, there were also generalized um, prophets in the church, members in the church in Acts 13, verse 1. Um, Agabus and his company, uh, they were actually charged to go to Jerusalem with some finances, uh, but they were trusted because they were men of integrity and they could be trusted with some resources to go back. Um, and you might have remembered reading about Philip the evangelist. He had four unmarried daughters who could prophesy. They weren't just prophetic gifts. They were strong prophetic ministries in their own right. Um, so, men and women, you know, can prophesy. Uh, there's references about uh, when Jesus was being um, brought to the temple as a young child. There was an old woman who was a prophetess in her own right, and she was waiting to see Jesus. Then she knew she could die. Um, there was a sense of, you know, woman and ministry on that transition. So there's lots of the prophetic uh, ministries in the church or pro prophetic offices in the church, okay? So, has anyone got a $50 note, or a $20 no. note, or a $10 note? $10. Yeah? Um, can, can I borrow it? Or, yeah. or $100, we really good? Thanks, mate. Oh, that's not a boomerang, that's, that's really quite good. Oh, thanks. Oh, oh, okay. And so, we're talking about watermarks, okay? And so, uh, basic understanding for um, stopping the counterfeit, in our country, we've got watermarks in our notes. Uh, some countries have got it really um, right out there. Some are quite subtle. And so we have it in our, uh, our currency here. And so when we look at the prophetic, we're really looking at the watermarks or the authenticity of what a prophet really is. There's common things that you'll always seek to uh, recognize. You know, and I think immediately, like most prophets are actually wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. They're right down the line. They're black and white. Uh, they don't muck around, um, a, and they call it for what they, they see it pretty, pretty quickly. They're not sort of woolly and waffly and 
drifting everywhere though, right down the line. But when we look at the watermarks of a prophet, what we see is they never, ever, ever contradict the word of God. And so if you've got a prophet that brings something which is a little bit eh, 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 start to ease back, you know, start to assess what's happening. Um, they will never introduce new doctrine or practices to the church. Never do that. Um, they will generally confirm what's going on. Uh, it's always coming back to a biblical foundation. Always glorifying Jesus. Um, if it doesn't bring honour to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, there's something wrong. There's a lot of false prophetic ministries that are actually out there, um, sadly. We talk about um, the good things of the prophets, but we see in the end times there's going to be false apostles and false prophets. So this is basically a really clear indication of what is true and what is incorrect. Um, so important. Okay, a prophet stands the test of time. So if he's actually prophesying clearly about something down the future, if it's not happening, it's like, well, it's just an empty voice. But generally, there's a specific thing that's actually been revealed futuristically, and then you look back and think, oh, man, that happened. as part of the test of what's going on. And also, do you want this back? <laughs> For what? Afterwards. Yeah. 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 You cast your $10 notes upon the water. Um, but they also echo what other prophetic people are doing. Okay, And so your prophetic drafting, you pick up on the themes that are coming through. And so this morning that Pastor James talked about the Cary Swamp, and uh, there was, uh, I think, uh, who was it, Chris talked about something um, similar. I was actually getting a very similar picture, not Cary trees, but I was seeing the Northland beaches, and I'm seeing all these shipwrecked um, boats, um, and all these uh, treasure chests, and uh, all this uh, flotsam and jetsam on the beach. And I'm seeing Munro coming and discovering these uh, shipwrecked uh, things on the beach and restoring them. And so it's a very similar thing to what, exactly what Pastor James talked about, about restored lives, but it was just another tangent explaining exactly the same thing. And so the prophetic echo are the prophetic voices. Okay? And so quite clearly we've got these watermarks of the, of the prophet. The other way of looking at it is what, through the hallmarks of a prof, prophet's ministry. The hallmarks are basically the trends, the traits that you'll actually just see. What they do is they bring God's guidance and direction for an individual, for a church, a movement, uh, an institution. Uh, quite often in denominations it's actually working out this way, this way as well. And so when we see a prophet as such, the first thing you generally recognize is that it's actually translocal. What does that mean? What's translocal mean, do you think? Anyone? Cross local ministries. Cross local ministries. Excellent. I was going to give you $10, but uh, someone's put it, put it away. Uh, translocal. So generally, a prophet is moving out of a local church. They're moving regionally, nationally, city to city, generally across uh, movements. Uh, they're ex accepted pretty much wherever they go. It can actually be an international ministry. And so translocal, they're normally outies, they're not inies. Um, they reveal the future uh, as part of the prophetic foretelling, of, uh, or pre not predicting, but foretelling with what is going on. Uh, they bring God's vision to people. So why is it that God gives images and visions to people? You know, it's pretty clear, a picture speaks a thousand words. And so what they're doing is they're bringing God's vision into a company of people. Um, and quite often it's just uh, like a reference point. Um, I know I was going to, um, Sunday evening, I was going to South Auckland to speak at a church. And the closer I got to the church, all this revelation started to layer on uh, in my mind. And the more I got there, all this extra stuff started to sort of pile, pile into what was going on. And so what I was actually seeing, seven years ago, a church had a prayer meeting, a series of prayer meetings, and they'd actually spoken and prayed into this um, principality that was restricting the growth of their church. Uh, and that was the, uh, the general first revelation. And then as I prayed about it and, and as the worship went on in the service, God started to show me more and more about this principality. Over seven years, this uh, fallen spirit had actually regenerated itself. It got stronger and stronger. Um, it had come back. And what it was doing, it was actually... Um, it was a spirit of... Uh, what it, called, it, it was 
disrupting people. And what I'm starting to see are th three layers of things. One was an immediate thing that was happening now. One was happening seven years ago. And one thing was actually happening uh, about 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And what I could actually see in the spirit, these uh, col uh, people coming from England were coming to New Zealand as uh, early uh, colonials. And they weren't the oldest son. It was generally the third or fourth or fifth son. And they were coming to New Zealand and they were forcing the people off their land. Um, and this is actually in Papakura, and they were forcing people off. And, um, bef and then it went back a, a generation or two before that, and I'm seeing these Maori people force the other Maori tribes off the land. And so I'm getting all this layered revelation. And so as the worship happened, I was getting more and more insight to what was going on. And so I was with the pastor, and he said, wow, this is incredible. Um, what else have you got? And then the Lord put this name into my spirit, and it was called Girashna. You think, what a weird name. You know, Girashna, you know, what is that, you know? Um, so, clear as, clear as you guys in this room, all this revelation was. And so, I got back home and um, I thought, I've got this name, Girashna, what is this? Because all the elders wanted to know more about what was happening. And so, I went to my uh, Greek Chaldees dictionary, opened it up, and right before me, this word Girashna jumped out. And what it meant is dispossession, as a man would dispossess his wife and cast her out and reject her, um, or kick a child out of the home, I'm thinking, this is exactly what's been happening in this church. And so the church had this massive prayer meeting. They thought they'd dealt with this principality and power seven years ago, and they had, but somehow this thing had come back, and it was starting to force itself back in because it didn't want to be dispossessed from where it was, uh, had its bastion. So revelation will come, and it's giving this whole insight to what's actually happening. It's like a... Um, uh, you know, you do a flyby on a plane and you can look down and you can see certain things. This was the God's perspective into the situation in Papakura. Um, and so Pastor Viv talked about revelation. I could read 10 books about that sort of thing and it wouldn't have done nothing for me. But by that first-hand revelation that God was speaking and coaching and training me to this end through this church, it was like, whoa. And I've never forgotten the name Gerushna ever since. Um, several other things have happened like that in the, in the past as well, which we don't have time to talk about. But be opening to ask God questions. If God's starting to speak to you, say, I don't understand that. Um, or just don't rush to conclusions. Get yourself in an environment where you're actually hearing God's vo uh, voice. Worship is critical for that. And you'll just get things accelerated uh, into you. Uh, also, uh, number five, uh, they arouse people from complacency. They stir, they provoke, they challenge. Um, there's something that just motivates and charges and inspires people. Um, and so classic hallmarks of what prophets are about. Okay, just as a quick um, summary between the old and the new, because we talked a little bit about um, some of these old fuddy duddies, uh, what they dressed or, or wore or the, what they didn't wear. You know, why, would, why did someone have to go around in a mouldy uh, loincloth? Or someone was actually asked to go and wear nothing. You know, that's pretty challenging. Uh, the Old Testament, but generally they were ones of judgment. Um, you look at the Old Testament and there's a common thing. Oh, they're normally bringing heavy duty words and it generally is one of judgment. Uh, but yes, they're also bringing direction to a situation. Uh, hopefully people would listen and respond. Sadly, many times they never did. Um, Often these prophetic uh, voices in the Old Testament had a geographical um, sphere or grace. So you think of someone like uh, Jonah. Where did he go? He went to Nineveh. And so straight away, bang. Uh, some of the prophets were called strictly to um, Israel and some were called more to, uh, to Judah. Um, and so we see this uh, geographical aspect come through. And some actually brought brought a verse, or a, not a verse, a, a word of punishment to situations uh, to wake people up. Not particularly nice. Whereas the New Testament, it's a better place to be, the words are more of grace, orientation. They are one of warning. Um, they are designed to protect people. Um, only when something gets really out there and people are disobedient does God really intervene publicly sometimes, but not very often. Normally it's done in a gracious uh, way. Uh, what they normally do is they bring order into a situation. Um, it's, uh, so in a church we've got eldership, 
And so things are discussed in the church. Most things are done in eldership for the direction and guidance of the church. Um, but sometimes uh, prophets are brought into those environments to be able to help confirm that. Because uh, so, if things aren't quite sure, they could be asked to uh, speak into that situation. So we had a guy, uh, Ian Butler, uh, uh, he came as a, when we are having the ordination of the, uh, the elders here. So he came along and actually started to speak into that situation as well. Uh, but that's part of the translocal uh, ministry. Uh, the apostolic movement where I uh, got ordained originally was, um, like I said before, they had uh, national executives and the apostles would come and they would do the apostolic thing and make decisions. And then at the end of the uh, council, they would invite ordained prophets in and uh, quite often they would go in and say, verily, verily, not, I wouldn't do the old English, but they'd say, verily, verily, this is what you've discussed over these uh, three days. You've done this, you've done this, you've done this, but you're out of step and out of alignment on this particular issue. You, you know, and you need to uh, readjust the situation or whatever. And uh, very, very clear what happened. Um, and so what they were doing is bringing order into a situation before things went off course. Okay, uh, what they always do is they inspire to righteousness. Obviously f spoke, focusing on Jesus, bringing righteousness into the uh, heart of the situation. And they bring in partation. So when Len came in, what's he doing? He's bringing in partation. Um, he, yes, he comes to preach and teach as well, but he will prophesy over people in the congregation. And what's happening, there's an impartation coming and injecting something into people's hearts, lives, and building people up. There's a real motivation that happens. Um, quite often when I go into situations, um, and I do prophetic, uh, what they do, the pr prophetic presbyteries, and I go in there, because sometimes the prophets are known by a house, everyone starts to get familiar and know what's happening, so I might have been called in as an external person, and I might go prophesy over all the leaders. And some of these people were saying, why is prophesying over all the leaders? What about everybody else? You know, and it's like um, this happened in one of the New Life churches um, once upon a time. This older prophet who knew everyone in the New Life movement, uh, he was wanting, his agenda was to prophesy over all the people who weren't leaders. That's what he wanted to do. And I come in cold and I start to prophesy over all the leaders. Um, but what it's doing, it's um, bringing your voice into a situation. Uh, I went into a situation in... Um, a staff meeting in a, in a large church overseas once, and I prophesied over all the, uh, all the staff there. I didn't know anyone from a bar, a bar of soap. But why was that? God was speaking in and through because he wanted to encourage the leaders. And then in another situation I came, there was a church planning uh, conference going on, and I spoke, I literally prophesied over all the people that had come in from all over the country that were um, starting new churches. And they were saying, how does this guy know about these church planters? You know, um, and they're about... 20 of them there. They are the only ones that got prophetic words. And so revelation comes, impartation comes, and it actually inspires people. Okay, so the New Testament is translocal. We've covered that. So they're outies, they travel around, but they're generally very contemporary. They're modern, what they do. They're not dated. They're not in a time warp. Uh, they're relevant. They've got a now word. Uh, they're authentic. They're true. There's, uh, there's, there's no mistaking who they are. Always consistent with the word of God. They're relevant. You know, if, if they're not relevant, they're out of step. So they're right in sync with what's going on. They're direct and they're powerful. Um, most prophetic people who I know are right down the line. Um, there's, there's no mis mistaking what they're doing. Uh, they're also hopefully understandable. Now, I'm probably speaking too quickly to, tonight, so hopefully um, I can be understandable. I will try and speak slower if you listen quicker, okay? Um, the journey very powerful. Um, you know, things are happening in the spirit, especially if the commissioning is taking place and things like that. Um, always edifying. Um, always building up. So all prophetic words, uh, you know, word of God, is this building people up or is this putting people down? Is this condemning? You know, you want to make people feel really cool. As soon as you go off these parameters, it's like warning, warning. Will Robinson, something's wrong there. Okay, uh, so who can be a prophet? You know, is it like um, I've been to um, university, I've studied all this theology for five years, I've got a doctorate, um, now can I be a prophet? Um, you know, or do I just want to barge my way into this role? You know, because there might be a lot of esteem that went with that, with that um, office. People grow in the gift, um, quite naturally. And we want to see everyone in this room 
break the sound barrier. We don't want you to see just one or two words. We want a stream. We want a vibe of what's going on um, in the prophetic in the church. So the prayer meetings on Wednesday night, um, really encouraging this week. We had some time at the end where people were having prophetic revelation and straight away the gifting that they're carrying is being brought forth and some amazing words came and lots of encouragement. Um, making sure the church is right on track. Okay. The difference between the gift and the ministry, uh, prophets are, are an appointed role. Remember they're a, a gift of Christ, but they just don't say, da-da, here I am. There's a sense of uh, development and grooming and growing. Um, there's no rule of thumb how it always happens, but generally it happens in two ways. There's generally a private revelation, like a, uh-huh, Lord, I think I'm actually coming into something and there's like an uncomfortableness, but there's a sense of, why me, Lord? Uh, but there's a growth, a personal revelation. And there's a sense of, yeah, that's right. And then also other people are looking on from the outside. And they're starting to see this emerging gift ministry office. And quite often apostles and prophets will recognize it. Um, so straight away, going back in uh, my timeline, um, I was functioning probably more on a teaching role. I was functioning... Uh, strongly in the apostolic and strongly in the prophetic. And so the uh, executive in the apostolic movement wanted to ordain me, and they were confused because they didn't know what to actually call me, a teacher, a prophet, or apostle. And there was this hyphenated, this blend of this teacher, apostle, prophet. So they recognized the office, but they didn't say, you have a singular gift, you have a multiple gift. And so sometimes, like an evangelist, it's easy to actually recognize a singular gift. Oh, you are an evangelist. Or, yes, you are a teacher. Well, I will, you're teaching in Bible college, you know, seven days a week sort of thing. Uh, sometimes there's a hyphenated blend. But what happens, you have a, an inner conviction that God is calling. And for me, the executive said to me, Phil, go away and pray about it. So I went down to Pawanui for Easter weekend. And literally within three or four days, I just had this stream of prophetic scriptures out of Titus and Timothy and all this stuff was talking about leadership and eldership and prophetic. And it's like, oh, uh, that's heavy duty stuff. But it really confirmed to me, hey, this is where God was calling me. He was taking me out of the corporate arena and putting me, putting me securely into church leadership for the future. And then the external people were starting to pro prophesy and speak prophetically and confirm that role as well. And so it comes from within. And it also comes from recognition from outside ministries. So why are there five-fold essential ministries in the church? Ephesians 4.11, we've seen this to start off with. Christ gave these gifts, that's the apostles, pastors, teachers and evangelists, to God's work. Why? For the equipping of the saints. Um, break that down. Not just uh, warm fuzzies, it's actually for service. Uh, why? Well, until... The church has attained the unity of faith, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Mature people, um, full of stature, um, the fullness of Christ. That's why these ministries are still on planet Earth. The church isn't perfect. But these ministries are here for this purpose. It's part of that responsibility. Um, and we're still trying to fathom it out. Um, and just as an aside in our church, I think it's really cool, you know, the fact that we've actually got really secure prophetic apostolic ministries. Um, not many churches in the country would have such a robust foundational base. Um, it's just the way God is mandating this church. And uh, you start to see the uniqueness of the Ascension Ministries work together. Okay, restoration of the Ascension Ministries. Uh, remember, obviously, in the first century, these gifts were just automatically part of the church. And then it was like the enemy wanted to dilute, um, discredit what was going on, take the, the giftings away, steal what was going on. And uh, really what's been happening, there's been a restoration of these ministries progressively um, over the years, and more specifically over the last century. But this is what it says in 1, Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Here are some of the parts of uh, God's appointed for the church, uh, firstly the apostles, secondly the uh, prophets, thirdly the teachers, then those who uh, do miracles, those who have giftings of healing, those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, and those who uh, speak in unknown languages or unknown tongues. So this is part of the foundation of the church for a reason. 
You know, why do they say, you know, firstly, secondly, thirdly, as part of the foundations going down. So if you build a house on no foundations, you know, everything's going to get washed away. It's not going to stand the test of time. And so we've got, we've got these ministries here for a reason. But what we're starting to see uh, is a, a restoration. So in the 1960s, 1965, uh, before then, we look back in church history and we see that people were generally called pastors in the church. You know, so you think of the local Anglican Vatica with uh, cucumber sandwiches and cups of tea on the front lawn of someone's house. Um, and they think of the pastor, you know, the, the, the gentle, mild, meek person. Uh, that doesn't bring a strong church. You know, it doesn't take away from the role of the pastor, but generally people were called pastors. But then all of a sudden when people were starting to realize God's doing something new. And in the 60s, we saw the restoration of the gift of the evangelist. And so, you know, we see straight away people like Billy Graham, you know, whole soccer stadiums, whole arenas filled up with people that had the strong gift of an evangelist. Uh, we had a guy in New Zealand called... Um, someone king, Mary pastor, and he was out, out there outreach, outdoor outreaches and phenomenal things were taking place in his ministry. Jump forward into the 70s, uh, charismatic renewal, and it was all about the teaching gift being restored. So we had people like Derek Prince, uh, Judson Cornwell, uh, Jack Hayford, Bob Mumford, all these key ministries out there. And they were bringing the office of the teacher uh, to the forefront. Uh, I got saved in Queen Street Assembly of God and we had uh, Neville Johnson uh, who was the pastor at the time. His primary gift was teacher, uh, Brian Bailey. People like that, um, they were bringing high caliber teaching uh, and people flocked to their ministries to understand God's word better. But that was in the 70s and then jump forward into the 1980s we see all of a sudden God's restoring the prophet to the church. and. You know, we saw the prophetic happen before, but there was more of the office of the prophet being uh, re-established. Apostolic movement, uh, where I got ordained, they recognized that right from the Welsh Revival. Other movements like the Assemblies of God weren't quite sure, so they didn't make a decision on that until pretty much the 80s and, and the 90s, when they then start to recognize um, the office of a prophet on someone's life more clearly. And then in the 90s, we saw the... Uh, the restoration of the apostle starting to present itself. We could talk about the apostleship um, role probably for a whole new topic for one more night, but we won't do that tonight. But we see um, these ministries start to become very distinct. Some of them are singular, and some of them are what we call hyphenated. They have a blend, okay? So if you look at Pastor James, his primary gift is apostle, prophet, teacher. There's a blend. You know, there's a homo homogenous uh, mix-up um, of who he is. And it's not like he's um, schizophrenic or got multiple personality disorders. Well, he might have. The, 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 the jury's still out. You know, probably living with Viv, anything could happen. But that's the way he is. You know, that's the way he's wired. Um, that's the same way I'm wired. You know, but how do we complement? How do we work together? Um, and so we've got this gifting given to the church for a reason. God's restored it for a purpose because the church isn't perfect. Um, the other way I'll actually look at this, um, if you look at the, the pastor, the pastor is generally married to the church, you know, loving, caring, kind, compassionate. Um, that's like the, the wedding finger, you know, the wedding, uh, what's it called? Ring. Ring finger, that's right, yeah. But then, as we look at the teacher, they are like the little pinky. They bring balance to the church. You know, uh, very distinct in their own right. Um, the evangelist is more like, uh, what's that called? The, the middle finger. Um, and so, remember the one-way Jesus um, sticker? All those old fossils can remember the one-way Jesus stickers? And so, they would be pointing to Jesus. And so, what would happen, they would come along and they would get into people's lives and really challenge and they'd point the way to the cross. And, and that was like the one way Jesus <coughs> pinky or finger. The prophet is more like the index finger. It's a little bit stronger than the other fingers. And they would, they would do the same. They would come and they would stir and they would challenge and they would provoke and they would point. And they would be like a meat hook getting into people's hearts and lives. And there would be a stirring and a pulling and a challenging and a pushing. Um, but that's like the index finger. And they're all legitimate in their own right. And then the thumb... Um, is a little bit different. It's designed to actually work with these other ministries. 
Okay? And so the farm, designed to work with the teacher, pastor, evangelist, and the prophet. But isn't it interesting that the thumb and the index finger work closely together? Okay? And so um, if I was to try and pick something up, like this, this manual, as a teacher, I could do it. I feel like you know, it's dysfunctional. I can do it, and I can get by, but it's a strain and an effort. But as soon as I introduce the apostle with these other ministries, it's a no-brainer. Really, really easy. And what's actually happening in the body of Christ, um, uh, Anisha, if you can come with me, you just pretend you're an apostle right now, or a prophet coming. And so you're coming with your ministry. Which finger? You pick, you pick it. You, it's up to you. And you're trying to pick that up, you know, together. You're grabbing it and lifting it. So that's one ministry working together. But as soon as another one comes together, do, they do it together. There's so much ease. Or if you had someone else like Alistair come along holding something up, there's a power and a strength and an amplification of what's going on. And so together there's a power. Uh, and so what we're starting to see corporately as these apostolic prophetic ministries, essential ministries work together, there's a robustness, there's a powerhouse that's actually coming. Quite exciting. And so you can function as an apostle by yourself, but you're going to be limited in what you can actually do. Okay? So this is just a really simple... Um, what's happened here? Yeah, um, yeah, it's just a really simple understanding of the role of these, of these individuals, okay? It's a, it's a very clear picture for you to take away. Um, and then, yeah, the apostles are really strong, but they can't be working by themselves. You know, it's, it's like they're not designed to work by themselves. They have to work with these other ministries, okay? And so moving on quickly, the example, uh, the other one I tend to use often is with anatomy, my backgrounds and uh, the medical side of things. Uh, but if, if we look at pastors, they're like the skeletal systems, the, uh, the skeleton, you know, the, you know, the bone. neck bone, tailbone, you know, femur, tibia, yeah, all, all these bones connected. But what they do is they provide structure to the body, you know, for us, the church, to hang our lives on, okay? Um, Evangelists can be equated to the uh, reproduction system. Uh, obviously, they're introduce, uh, introducing new people to the faith. There's a rebuilding, a rebirthing of people. People are getting born again. Uh, so we can look at evangelists as the reproductive system. Teachers are like the digestive system. You know, food in, all the goodies and baddies, we get rid of the rubbish. Um, and so they're like the digestive system. They're bringing food and nutrition. They're bringing health uh, to the body and getting rid of the rubbish. Uh, it's quite clear. Prophets are like the lungs, you know, the pneuma, uh, the breath of God, the, like the heart, and they cause breath and blood flow. They circulate with the body. Um, the digestive system is pretty much located in the stomach, whereas the prophetic ministry is actually with the whole body, uh, the blood flow coming all the way through. Apostles, they're like the central nervous system, like we're talking the nerve endings, the brain connected. Uh, and you can't just have a head functioning by itself at all. Um, it's got to be connected with the body. So the apostles are connected with the body. Um, if I was to chop off an ear, I could survive. I could chop off an arm or a leg and I can survive. Um, I could take my appendix out, I could survive. Can't survive without a skeleton. Can't survive with it, well, probably could survive for a short time without a reproductive system, but, you know, life wouldn't go on as we'd <coughs> need it to. Couldn't survive without a stomach, digestive system, you know, even if I had colostomy bags and everything else coming in and out of me, it wouldn't work. Uh, can't survive without a heart or a lung. Can't survive without a head and a central nervous system. So we need to have these ascension ministries in the church, you know, as we become dysfunctional and we become... Um, a joke, really. We're probably not doing what we're called to be doing. Uh, so, what about the call? You know, where does this all start? Well, it starts with an awareness that God is calling you and directing you. Um, normally, it would happen uh, simultaneously where external people are sensing a call on your life, and also it would happen privately. But also, too, um, we all have a call in our life. It's not about these special people. Um, <laughs> We all have a call of God in our life. We've all been called out of the kingdom, kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. 
Each of us in this room tonight or watching on the video, we are called for a purpose. We've got a mandate in our life. We've got a calling and we can't run away from that. Um, don't want to, you know, remember Jonah, he tried to run away, he couldn't escape that call. Once he got him back on course, bang, you know, things happen really, really quickly. The call to an ordained office of the prophet, this has to be recognized, uh, not just from yourself, but it has to be recognized externally. Um, many uh, movements will officially ordain you um, to that role, uh, set you apart or commission, or there might be just in a general understanding that you're called to an ascension ministry gift and they just leave it at that uh, because they're not quite sure about these other unique people, you know. But the, 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 the church is changing and they're starting to recognize specifically the prophet and apostle more. They've always recognized the evangelists and the teachers because that's a little bit safer to understand. But more often than not now, even like brethren movements, uh, people like that, they're clearly recognizing the role of the prophet and apostles in those churches. Okay, so acting without a calling is dumb. It's very presumptuous. We've got to do this wisely. Uh, there's too many loose gooses out there bringing all sorts of rubbish into the church. Um, I was in uh, Mandalay in Burma um, about five or six years ago, and this person was flashing around this business card, you know, and had it on the bottom, Apostle, Prophet, and he was from the Philippines. And I'm thinking, what are the Apostle and Prophets from? You know, he was just a loose goose. He was a lone ranger. He was a predator. And he was saying, well, if you invite me to your church, um, and you pay me all this money, I'll prophesy into your heart of your church. It's like, really? You know? So there's all these false people out there. And so it starts with an awareness, but we can't be presumptuous. We've got to be wise in what we do. Okay? So stepping into the office of a prophet, we have this private encounter and we have this uh, formal encounter at the same time where the call on your life is recognized more than a call, it's recognized more than a ministry, it's recognized as an office. And then what will happen generally is there's like a probation period or a testing, there's a, there's a uh, um, assessing of the person's calibre and ministry, and then there will be a formal recognition of what that is. And that happens differently in different movements and different churches. But generally, there's a private and a formal commissioning and a confirmation of that in the ministry. Okay, uh, key virtues, uh, they're full of the Holy Spirit. Not of themselves, they're full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they are not just a, uh, a voice, uh, but they are, they are speaking with the power of God on their life and through their life. Uh, you, you, you will generally see miracles, um, signs and wonders take place. Um, there's a total obedience about a prophet. Uh, there's a higher standard of holiness. Uh, they're generally praying more. They're setting themselves apart more. There's a real um, ownership of the call in their life. So they just can't rock up onto a, a church if they're asked to speak at a church next Sunday morning. They don't rock up um, getting out of bed, have a coffee, straight into the church and just blabber on. There's a generally a, a percolation of going, going on during the week before you even get there. So you're bringing a prophetic sermon, but there was also a prophetic revelation coming um, for individuals as well. Um, there's a high relationship with God. Uh, they speak out of this encounter. So Pastor Viv talked about revelation this morning. Uh, personal encounter. God's giving this download. Um, there's, there's this drip coming into you. Not this drip, but this, there's this uh, drip flow coming into your life where you're getting this layered revelation and God is teaching and training you. Sometimes it's for yourself. Sometimes it's for an individual. Sometimes for it's a, a cluster of people like a church. Uh, sometimes you're getting this revelation you think, don't know what to do with that. You know, like um, sometimes you go into a church and it's like there yeah, could be 250 people there or 500 people. Who are these words for? And then the Spirit will generally identify when you're speaking. Um, I, was in, um, I was actually in Tauranga once speaking and the Lord um, just showed me a guy as he got out of his car and walked into the car park into the church. He had a red checkered shirt on and the Lord said, I want you to prophesy over him. Okay, I can do that. When? I'll tell you when. So halfway through preaching, I could see this, I didn't, couldn't see this guy. Uh, the Lord said, I want you to prophesy over this guy now. And I said, there's a guy here in a red checker shirt. Uh, can you um, stand up? And he had actually been sitting up in the balcony and had actually fallen asleep. I didn't recognize him, but he'd fallen asleep. <laughs> and his wife was going, <laughs> wake, wake, wake up. Um, and he'd actually done two back-to-back -back shifts. You know, so he's actually pretty tired, so he nodded off. Uh, but then the Lord really wanted to zero in some you know, personalized mail for him. But God showed me very clearly that was the word for that individual. So you're getting into the zone, you're getting into the sink of the spirit. You know, uh, 
speaking out of a private encounter with the Spirit, uh, with the uh, Holy Spirit, with the Lord. Okay, patience. Uh, not that most prophets are patient, uh, but there's a time spent with God where there's just a, an encountering with God. You're setting, you're setting yourself aside with the Holy Spirit. Uh, things are coming. The revelation is coming. So you need to have time together. David spent a lot of time with the sheep, but really was spending a lot of time with the Lord. And that's where all the Psalms started to come. There was an encounter with God. Okay. Uh, there's generally integrity and honesty about a uh, prophet uh, because prophets permeate truth. You look at a prophet, truth is normally just layered everywhere you go. It's, like, it's part of his and her countenance and his being. Okay. There's a boldness and there's courage. Uh, they're, they're more a, most prophets are actually right at the front. They're right out there. They're not, not holding back. They're on the leading edge. They're pushing, pushing, pushing. So that takes boldness. It takes courage. Uh, they generally have to go into situations where there's daunting things sometimes that need to be done, especially if someone is uh, doing something inappropriately. Like, you know, you're having a good sleep and all of a sudden the Lord wakes you up and shows you things. You know, someone's going into this motel room and you see the name of the motel and you see the room number, then you see the car coming in and the red car and the, the guys and the girls are getting out and they go in and things happen. What do you do with that? You know, um, it's for a reason. You know, uh, you, you can spook people, but it takes, you know, boldness and courage to be able to deal with that. But you've got to do it, deal with that in an appropriate way. Uh, but that's part of the, the territory of the prophet, okay? Danger. Test and prove all things. This happens on the gift level, ministry and office. Uh, there's so much loose goose stuff taking place out there. And uh, we just got to make sure that everything is done correctly. And so one reason why we're doing this prophetic training is we want to make sure that the prophetic in the church is robust. It's powerful. Um, we don't want to model um, bad things. We want to do the right things because the emerging people after this generation of people will be looking at you guys as, uh, oh, that's what they're doing. I'll do the same thing. And so if you're doing things that are inappropriate, that's going to put a bad um, example that people will probably start to follow. So we've got to make sure that things are tested and proven. There again, let's try and keep our prophetic voices succinct and clear. Uh, quite often we get the prophetic word, but what are we supposed to do with it? What is the address for this prophetic revelation that God is giving us? What are we supposed to be doing with it? Uh, ask those questions. Often on Sunday morning we've had a lot of people had private revelation given to them through the week, and that's like God speaking to them as an individual. Then all of a sudden they come to church and they get the microphone and it's like... Blah, 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 and all this stuff comes out, private revelation for the individual, but it's not the revelation for the church. So you've got to be very careful where you bring the word and how it's given because um, we want the right modelling. So danger, test and prove all things. Make sure you're on track. If you're not sure, ask someone. Uh, it's better to ask and uh, keep it safe for people than to do your own little thing and then all of a sudden you realize you're so far off course it's not helping everyone apart from yourself go downhill okay test and prove all things okay when we look at a prophet we're looking at um, various uh, things so if you see arrogance start to personify itself uh, there's something wrong there has to be a humility um, there's not an elitism or superiority about the prophetic people who i know um, there's just part of their persona, their demeanor of who they are. Um, Non-accountability. Uh, isolation and independence um, is an accident waiting to happen. Uh, too many prophets are lone rangers. There has to be an accountability. There has to be a connection um, with their peers, their churches, their oversights. Uh, if you haven't got that, it's like the glue's going to start to come unstuck pretty quickly. Can't have that. So we've got to have good accountability have to be belonging to a local church. Um, you can't just have a lone ranger charging around and they haven't got a home church uh, to actually um, be like the runway for you to take off on and come back on. Uh, that's just a real no-brainer. Too many loose gooses are out there. Okay, time tested. Any prophetic voice has to be tested. Um, bottom line, proof of the pudding. Is this prophetic word that they're sharing actually a real word or just a whole bunch of noise. Um, so it always has to be authentically tested by time. Okay, uh, moving on quickly. Jeremiah says this, so a prophet who predicts peace must show he is, he is right. 
only when his predictions come true can we know that he really is from the Lord. So all these Old Testament prophets prophesying, what signed them off as being a prophet, their predictions came true. Okay? And just wrapping up real quickly before we move on to some other things, uh, how, do we hire, how do we handle higher level prophetic? Um, because generally we're understanding base level prophetic, we're growing in our gifting. It's no longer a gifting. It's more of a ministry. It's more robust. We're coming into an office. It's more muscular. There's more potency. There's more power. Uh, firstly, um, these words have to be assessed. Uh, how do we do this? Assessed by, le assessed by leadership. Well, what is the leadership? Generally, it's the leadership of a church, the eldership, other apostles and prophets. They will weigh up and process what's going on. Really encouraging. I was in uh, Singapore once, and I was actually, you probably know David Peters? Okay, um, he's a prophet, and um, he was speaking in a really, 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 really large church. And we discovered that we're actually going to be arriving there for the same weekend, doing ministry in different churches. And we discovered that we're going to have the Sunday evening off for a change. And so we came together and we had a meal, and, just, and I said, before you mention anything, Dave, I want to tell you this. And um, I said, you've been here for the week, and uh, you've been discussing this, 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 and this. And you've had this uh, situation with the eldership. And it was like, how do you know all this sort of stuff? And so the eldership in this particular church was wanting confirmation that they should be doing what David had suggested. And so he got on the phone. He wanted me to actually have a meeting with their eldership on the Monday morning before I flew to uh, Myanmar. And I uh, said, it's not going to happen because they're not going to be at the airport at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning. And so he said, I'll organise for you to meet these elders when you come back on the following week. So they picked me up at Changi Airport, whisked me back to the office, into the boardroom. And what I'd actually shared with David, he said, can you now represent what was going on? So it was like a real confirmation to the eldership environment coming in by another prophetic voice. Um, so that actually gave them courage to make some of the big decisions that they had to make in the church. It wasn't done in a public arena, it was done in a private eldership setup. Okay, is it biblical? Well, does it ratify what the Bible says? Does it confirm, does it clarify what the scriptures say? Also looking at the correct forum. Um, is it um, bringing order? Is it uh, giving security to what's going on? Uh, are there others present? Always prophetically, we've got to have other people present. You just don't come up and say, psst, 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 I've got a word for you. <laughs> it's better to do it in a public environment where people can actually be there. The other thing too is if you're growing in the prophetic, it's always good to stand alongside someone. And so like if we have altar calls or something like that, mm. I'm quite often looking for people that I can actually grab with me to stand, especially if they're growing in a gift, that they can actually hear and see what's going on and quite often I'll say to them look okay what do you think what are you seeing and they go <gasps> you know and all, all of a sudden they start to say something and it's like bang on and it builds their faith up and so we've got to do it in the safety of others uh, it's a safe place yeah. uh, okay always edifying always exhorting building people up uh, does it bear witness to your spirit if you've got a word that just crushes you or condemns you or freaks you out and it, it, you just know it's not right, straight away you realise it's wrong. Um, does it resonate? Does it sit well with you? Um, these prophetic words always will be able to, uh, to, to do that and confirm that. So generally, people in this room probably won't have to worry so much about high level prophecy and measuring of that. That's normally done in a, an eldership meeting or places like that. Um, so, uh, but it's always good to understand that this is still biblical. It still relates to what's happening in a gift or a ministry or an office. Okay. So just briefly in closing tonight, um, why don't you just get groups of three and just pray, prophesy loosely. It doesn't have to be long-winded, just short, sh sharp um, words of encouragement uh, because you've been sitting down for a long time and it gets you off your chuff and it starts to get you guys um, being prayerful and prophetical at the same time. Okay. So God bless you. Same time, same channel next week.